Hello, everybody. My name is Parn, and today I will be helping you all answer the question, can I publish a paper with grammatical errors? So a lot of you may have wondered or been concerned about this before, and I'm not quite sure where to find the answer or what the answer actually is. Allow me to break down this concern here today in this video. But before we get started, don't forget to like, share, and also subscribe to this channel. If you have any other questions, you can also leave a comment down below. All right, let's get started. All right, so let me break it down to you all first. Publishing a paper for the very first time may be nerve wracking for most of us. Whether it be your personal expectations or critiques, most of us will feel some kind of pressure. One of the most important aspects of academic writing is, there you go, grammar. It cannot be denied that grammar shapes the way we write and plays a dominant role in how readers comprehend written content. The key aspect in publishing a trustworthy paper is not how fancy your grammatical structure is, but how accurate your structural choices are. This helps prevent unnecessary misunderstanding and misinterpretation of your hard earned written research. All right, now, as most of you may know, there are three fundamental aspects in academic writing. And these are first, thorough content, second, consistencies, and third, coherence. However, I would like to introduce you guys into a little deeper topic like grammatical mistakes. And here's how we are going to do it. I will show you a list of examples that contains grammatical errors and how we can avoid them, all right? Okay. Now let's take a deep dive into the common grammatical errors that should be avoided when publishing an academic paper. Let's start with the first item here. And the first item I would like to talk about is plural versus singular. And this plural versus singular means that um, every noun in English also comes in a form of singular or plural. Is it important that you remember which form of the word are you using? You're using plural or using singular. And this will also relate to um, subject verb agreement. So when you put these words in a sentence, in a sentence, when you write it down, when you type it down, you just have to make sure that the subject that you use corresponds with the word form that come after. All right, so let's take a look at this example. Data regarding medical history, signs and symptoms, medications, and diagnostic test was collected, were collected. Which one is the correct one? So if you take a look here, you know that the word data is actually plural. So the correct way to use the sentence is were collected, not was collected. It is also good to know that a lot of scientific terms always come in its own plural or singular forms. They look strange. Um, and these words are stimulus, stimuli, nucleus, nuclei, and so on. Let's move on to our second item, okay? In this second item, I'd like to talk to you guys about tenses, okay? There are mainly two tenses used in writing an academic paper, present simple tense and past simple tense, okay? Here, I show you guys examples, the examples of how these two sentences, these two tenses, are used in, in sentence, okay? The first one, aspirin is commonly used as an anti-inflammatory or a blood thinner. The second one, aspirin was commonly used as an anti-inflammatory or a blood thinner, okay? So as you can see, for the former sentence, I use is, and the second sentence I use was, okay? Um, let, me describe, let me start by pointing out the difference between these two, okay? So when I use was commonly used, it entails that aspirin is no longer used today. It's just a past event, it's no longer used anymore, all right? Whereas when I use is, present simple tense, it means um, I state this as a fact that aspirin is still in use today. The information is still valid today. Let's move on now to sentence fragmentation, okay? When you write a sentence in English, it's important that you need to have a subject and a verb in your sentence, okay? And in many cases, um, in, in writing English, um, you're supposed to begin a sentence with a subject 
and follows by a verb, okay? Um, sometimes we forget to do that. Sometimes we don't begin our sentence with subject, okay? Let's take a look at, uh, let's take a look at the example down here. The condition worsened because there were some errors made, okay? As you can see, the second sentence is begins with the adverb because, okay? Um, well, I would like to say that, is it not recommended that, that you begin a sentence with because? The correct way to do this is to join these two sentences together like this. The condition worsened because there were some errors made. Simple as that. Let's get on with our fourth item, passive and active voice, okay? So the majority of sentences in English comes in an active form, meaning it has a subject that does something in the sentence. Is it an actor that does something in a sentence, okay? So um, in that case, it's not confusing, right? But there are some times when we, know, when we don't know exactly who the subject in the sentence is, in that scenario, in this case, we need to use a passive voice, okay? So take a look at the example here. Minimal data have collected on the subject. Hmm, something is off with this sentence, right? Because we know that data cannot collect themselves. The correct way of um, writing this sentence should be minimal data have been collected on the subject, have been collected on the subjects. As you can see, I use a passive voice in this sentence. Okay, let's move on to our next item, misuse a wish, who, that, aka relative clause markers, okay? Which are, these are used in modifying a sentence or part of a sentence, okay? Um, let's hear about two examples here, all right? The first one, the study examines the effect of drug A on female patient who is usually amplified during the patient's ovulation, okay? The second one, the study examines the effect of drug A's on female patient, which is usually amplified during the patient's ovulation, all right? So now let's think about it. What do you wanna talk about? You wanna talk about the effect of the drug, right? You wanna talk about the fact that it's amplified during the patient ovulation. So you should go with which, not who, because when you use who, you talk about a person, okay? In this case, you wanna talk about an effect. So you go with which. Let's talk about the use of comma. Specifically, the use of comma in front of a relative clause marker, okay? Um, but before we go on with that, I like to introduce you to what identifying clause is and what non-identifying clause is, okay? So identifying clause means the information, a piece of information, a sentence, that is really important to that sentence. It cannot be omitted. Is it significant to understand the sentence? In contrast, non-identifying clause means the piece of information that is not really important and therefore can be omitted, okay? Let's take a look at the example down here. They have less risk of developing the disease compared to patients who were given the placebo. Okay, as you can see, this sentence, it has um, a comma in front of who, okay? So now let's try to read the sentence without a comma. They have less risk of developing the disease compared to patients. Hmm, does that make sense to you? Well, it doesn't, right? Because who were given the placebo is considered as essential information, consider it as identifying clause because is it really crucial to understand how uh, the whole sentence is constructed? So in this case, you shouldn't use a comma in front of who, all right? So if you wanna add information that's important, do not use comma, but if the information that you add, that you wanna add, is not really that important and can be omitted, you can use comma. Um, I want to talk to you about one of the most difficult concepts to grasp in this, um, in this lesson, okay? I want to talk to you guys about parallelism, okay? Um, so parallelism is actually a, a vague concept here, but, but bear with me here, all right? 
is a concept that you need to keep in mind as you write because it helps make sure that there's a clarity in in your sentence. Okay. Um, the concept of parallelism is when you um, use the same form or the same part of speech throughout your sentence. Okay, particularly in listing and in comparison. Okay, so now to apply this concept in in our lesson, I will show you two examples here. Two examples here. Okay, um, these two examples um, concerned with this concept of parallelism. The first one concerned listing. And the second one focuses specifically on an error when comparing two, two things. All right. So the first example, there are two main types of standard cancer treatments, surgical, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. Okay. Have you noticed something? Um, according, um, according to the list I give, I use surgical as an adjective while the rest are in noun forms. Okay, so in this case, you should make sure that the list you give are in the same form, all right? So by this rule, I have to change the surgical to its noun form, which is surgery, all right? So the, the correct sentence would be, there are four main types of standard cancer treatments, surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and immunotherapy. Sounds good, right? Sounds better. Now let's move on to, to our second example in, in parallelism. Okay. This one we can uh, this one will talk about comparison errors. Okay. I will show you two wrong examples and why they are wrong. And I show you the right one. The last one will be the right one. Okay. So here we go. The first one. The prevalence of COPD in smokers was compared with non-smokers. This sentence is wrong because what are you trying to compare here, right? Are you trying to compare the prevalence or are you trying to compare non-smokers, okay? So you have to make sure that you compare what you're trying to compare are the same things. You're trying to compare the prevalence in A with the prevalence in B, not prevalent in A and B. That doesn't make sense in writing, okay? The second one, the prevalence of COPD in smokers was compared with those in non-smokers. Okay, this one sounds better, right? Because I used a pronoun, I used those refer, to refer to the prevalence, right? But this sentence mm, is also wrong because the prevalence, take a look there. Um, when you use a noun, uh, when you compare, you have to make sure that what you compare agree in number as well. Meaning if you use the, the first one, the first part, the prevalence, as a singular noun, right? You should compare it with another singular noun. Therefore, you cannot use those, okay? So here we come to the correct one, all right? The correct sentence should be, the prevalence of COPD in smokers was compared with that in non-smokers, okay? Here, I make sure that I, what I'm comparing are agree in number, and I'm making sure that I compare the right thing, okay? So to wrap this up, I would say uh, the concept of parallelism plays a very important role in listing, first in listing and second in comparison, all right? Next is inconsistency in English usage, as in American English and British English, okay? As you know, there are so many words that can be spelled differently according to the two English standards, American English and British English, okay? The rule here is when you write an academic paper, make sure you are consistent with word choice, with word choice, okay? In other words, stick to the particular standard of English usage. If you want to use British English, make sure you choose British English spelled words. And the same also goes for American English, all right? Let's take a look at the example here, the word labeled and the word leukemia. See how different they are spelled, okay? So if you have any, inform uh, if you have any question, check out the link here for more information about British English versus American English.
So that's it for the general grammatical mistakes people make when writing an academic paper. Now let's proceed to some tips and tricks I'd like you all to know. All right. So there are five things I want you to keep in mind when writing an academic paper. First, spelling. Okay. Make sure you choose the right word when writing. Watch out for words like principle, principle. See, they sound the same. Even though these two words sound exactly similar, but they do not mean the same thing. And misuse oftentimes can result in great misunderstanding. Okay. This um, and this rule is also applied to those hard to spell scientific terms as well. Okay. So make sure you get the spelling correct. Second, avoid first person narrative because it may sound subjective and always stick to the third person narrative. Here, I want to show you some examples. The first sentence, we conducted an experiment versus the experiment was conducted, all right? Make sure you always narrate a sentence in a third person narrative. And third, avoid complex sentences, okay? The longer the sentences, the harder it is to get your message across. Keep it simple, guys. Focus on the content you want to give to your audience. Number four, proof reading. Every time you finish your writing, go an extra mile by making sure that you proofread your work. Check both your grammar and content, okay? A tip to check for errors in sentence construction is by reading sentence by sentence backwards. And by this, I mean, start reading from the end of your work to the beginning, sentence by sentence. OK, so you won't be focusing on the content, but the construction itself. And the last one, number five, just write. OK, I know I've said so many things about grammatical mistakes, but just write, really. Don't get ahead of yourself by thinking you make a mistake, which will result in you not writing at all. All right. In other words, don't be afraid of making mistakes. Otherwise, you will never get it started. Be confident in yourself and your hard earned work, you can do it. To conclude what I have just said, to answer the question, can I publish a paper with grammatical mistakes? Yes, you can, but should you? No, right? Prevention is key. Therefore, thoroughly going through your paper before publishing will help you avoid unwanted criticism and the frustration of having your mistakes forever out there in the open. I hope all the common error examples and tips and tricks given will provide you with the sufficient tools for you to publish your paper at ease, okay? Thank you so much for listening to the end of this video, okay? Again, make sure you like, share, and subscribe to this channel. If you have any further tips and tricks you'd like to share with the English learning community, you can also drop us a comment down below. That's it for me today, guys. You can find me, Parn, at the line handle and the WhatsApp handle in the description below or scan the QR code displayed on the screen for any further inquiries. Can't wait to hear more from you guys. Best of luck. Thank you.